So, uh, hi guys, my name is Ben. Um, today we're going to touch on zero trust for applications. Basically, how is it that we can protect ourselves from zero day vulnerabilities in this, frankly, growing age of scary, scary things? Um, but before we do jump into that, I actually I like to start off uh, talking about who is it that we're fighting against? Who are the guys and girls that we need to be protecting ourselves against? And realistically, at the end of the day, they are cyber gangs, okay? We're going up against um, Lapsus. So uh, who remembers the Okta attack from earlier this year, okay? Um, is anyone here from Okta? No? Okay, that's good. <laughs> I was in Austin, Texas doing a uh, talk a while back, and I started talking about this, and then went, so there was the Okta attack, and then looked off just in the distance and saw the Okta guys staring me down and went, oh, crap, this is not good. Uh, yeah, we had the Okta attack by Lapsus. The really interesting thing with that attack was it was actually led by a 16-year-old kid based out of Oxford. Okay? We're not talking hardened criminals. We're talking a 16-year-old kid who thought, hey, let's see what can happen. We've then got um, Darkseid, who took down Colonial Pipeline, which is a, uh, a gas pipeline which supplies 45% of the fuel across the east coast of the US. Okay, 45% of the fuel. That was when, um, do you remember when you'd go online and you'd, you'd see all the funny videos of Americans in pickup trucks filling the back up with uh, gas and then driving away and it all shoots off the back, that kind of thing. And you think there's a health and safety issue here somewhere. That was the, uh, the colonial pipeline attack. Uh, we then have Conti who took down the Irish health service in early 2021, midst of a COVID pandemic, literally took down a health service. Uh, more recently, they were trying to overthrow a country, or I think it was Costa Rica. Um, trying to overthrow the Costa Rican government through a ransomware attack. So we're fighting against these insanely strong cyber gangs, and they act like sophisticated businesses, because at the end of the day, that is realistically what they are, okay? They are businesses. They have CEOs and execs, etc. And more often than not, they are nation-state sponsored by places like Russia, North Korea, Iran, China, etc. Now, how is it that they're doing this? More often than not, they're hacking. Now, when we think of hacking, we think of this. We think of a guy in a black trench coat randomly tapping on screens with some cool glasses on, or realistically anything that's connected to the internet. That is what uh, Silicon Valley and Mr. Robot and all of the other TV shows have kind of taught us about hacking. But if we break down hacking, what is hacking? It is, at the end of the day, finding a solution to a problem. That is it. Nothing more, nothing less. Just finding a solution to a problem. And often these groups, when they are hacking, are utilizing exploits. So in 2021, we actually had uh, an insane year for exploits. Uh, we had the SolarWinds attack. We then had an exchange vulnerability. I mean, two weeks ago, no, three weeks ago now, we had two more exchange vulnerabilities that were released. Um, we've then had RMM tools. So things like uh, there was the Casera attack, obviously. Um, but RMMs are remote monitoring and management. It's essentially the stuff that you guys would use to be able to manage your machines. Um, those are now being weaponized. You know, while you can do great things like deploying out software, threat actors will often use it to deploy out ransomware, okay? Um, this is nothing new to a specific RMM and a specific vendor. This is, frankly, just RMMs in general. Excellent tools, but can also be weaponized. We then have Print Nightmare. Again, absolutely terrible. We had the Office vulnerability. I don't need to name which one, because it seems like there's one every two weeks at this point in time. Um, we will go on to one of them in a second. And then Log4j. Log4j, does anyone remember this one? December 2021. Genuinely incredible vulnerability. Uh, it is my second favorite vulnerability for a very clear reason, which is an odd thing to say about second favorite. All of these, yes, okay, they're a bit of a pain in the ass. That's not great, okay? But what would happen is SolarWinds would release a patch. Microsoft would release a patch. Other RMM tools would release a patch. That patch then gets downloaded down to your machine, applies, you are then protected. Okay, nice and simple. Log4j is different because it relied on the Log4j, which is a, a, a logging tool built into um, Java. It's a free open source tool. It relied on the Log4j vendors to release a patch solving that problem. It then relied on every single vendor who's using that inside of the solution to apply that patch to their software. And then for them to push a patch out to your software now that you're actually using it. What have we got? We've got extra steps that are jumping through. I'm willing to bet there are people in this room that likely have software on their machine that is still vulnerable to the Log4j exploit. If you want to learn a bit more about Log4j, there is an excellent YouTuber 
uh, well, he's a security analyst by the name of John Hammond. Um, he's brilliant. Shows you basically a ton of new hacking techniques, etc. Uh, and he does a really, really great deep dive into Log4j uh, and actually shows how uh, he was able to hack a Minecraft server utilizing it. So if any of your kids are into Minecraft, I guess show them that and then maybe they won't play as much. But in 2021, there were over 21,000 CVEs, so common vulnerable exploits, basically exploits inside of software that we are aware of. That's the key thing, that we're aware of, okay? So far this year, I checked, we are now at 20,000. Uh, about two weeks ago, we were at 1950. We are going to overtake this. We are pretty much on track to now overtake this, which we would normally go, is great, yes, we've done it, woo. We are better than last year. This is not a good thing. We do not want to be having more exploits than last year. But why is it that we have these exploits? Because at the end of the day, when we really start to think about it, these exploits are happening because we are becoming a more technologically dependent world. Technology is running our lives more now than it ever used to. So we're going to have more of these exploits. And the one that I love to talk about the most is Felina. So who heard of Felina? It came out in June of this year. Cool, okay, we've got like two guys and a nodding gentleman over there. The rest of you are like, I don't know, tell me about this Felina. So Felina is actually named after an Italian city, I do believe. Uh, so I don't know the naming structure because it was found by a Japanese security group. I don't really know why they picked Italy or an Italian city, but that is where they decided to go. Um, Mr. Gentleman, who's doing the audio over on the left-hand side. Hello there. He can't hear me. Hello there. Yes, if I wonder, is that okay? Perfect. I didn't want to get over there and suddenly the audio gets quieter and quieter and quieter. I get very anxious stood in one place. So Felina is essentially an incredible vulnerability. It allows you to be able to execute anything on that machine. You can do essentially privilege escalation as well. So how does this vulnerability work? Let's, touch your, let's go through this. I'll show you what would happen. You would double click onto a .docx file, okay? Nothing interesting there and then it would go ahead and say, Yep, we're gonna start. We're opening up, this is great, everything's good. Now keep an eye on the screen because in a second you'll see a smiley face and that smiley face has now gone. It has disappeared, it is now being hidden by the program compatibility troubleshooter. It's for some reason detecting a problem. God knows why, who knows what the problem is? The Word document seemed to open. It's then gonna say it's gonna start resolving and then before you know it, something else opens up, PowerShell. PowerShell is just executed on my machine, okay? And then before I know it, a code starts running and then something else has popped up on my screen saying all of my data has been stolen. This is us weaponizing the exploit. So when we heard about this, we went ahead, uh, I worked with one of our solutions engineers to be able to get this uh, working. We essentially, what we wanted to show here is a very easy way to be able to steal your data, okay? So how does this exploit work? That will probably give you some background and understanding into this. Essentially, what it does is when you open up or, or when you who here uses 7-zip or WinRAR or something along those lines, yeah? And I hope you all use the paid versions, yeah? You're like the one person in the world who's ever paid for WinRAR. Um, so, essentially, if you were to take a .docx and right-click onto it and then go ahead and um, extract it, it will extract as a, uh, it's essentially a zipped file. It's got resources in it, it's got footers, it's got headers, etc. okay? Now, inside of there, if you have an image, it will normally be pointing to itself at the end of the day, okay? That's the easiest kind of description here. Now what you could do is change where it points to. So rather than pointing to itself, have it point to a malicious website with a malicious payload on it. Now that payload is gonna look like this command set that we've got right at the top of the screen. Uh, it's about 84-ish characters long. The reason we haven't shown the rest of them is because it's essentially commented out. So it's a really odd attack method. Basically what it does is it calls a program on your machine when it executes this called MSDT. From calling MSDT, it then runs a buffer overflow attack. It basically crashes MSDT. And then from crashing MSDT, it can then execute any command it wants across your machine. It can run any application. So we thought, well, we'll just keep it really simple. We'll go ahead, call PowerShell, and then using a command that we have internally, take a copy of your data, upload it to some Google Blob storage. So we can go down that route. Or call out to a malicious website, download an executable, and execute it, on that local machine. What have I just shown there? It's ransomware at the end of the day, right? From opening one single Word document, I can ransomware a machine. That was how terrifying this vulnerability was. Now, the great thing is Microsoft did patch it within 14 days. I could say that in another way. Microsoft patched it and it took 14 days. It depends on, you know, what side of the fence you want to sit on. 
I would say Microsoft patching something in 14 days is very, very good. So, Felina vulnerability was pretty terrifying. Now, threat actors are using these CVEs to make money. And what is the number one way that we're seeing? They use these CVEs to have footholds. They're using these vulnerabilities for, for footholds into machines because of ransomware. Every 11 seconds, a business is hit with ransomware. And I could sit here and shout ransomware statistics at you, but frankly, that's going to be boring because I would expect we all know about ransomware now because it's been on our radar for the last five years, yes? So we won't do that. Let's talk about something cooler, RAS. Who likes SaaS? SaaS, software solutions, software as a service, yeah? What about ransomware as a service? Like, this is where it gets really cool now. So threat actors, and I apologize, I have to start talking quicker now because I am going to, they will kick me off. Uh, so <laughs> ran software guys who, who create ransomware are very clever people. Let's make no mistake of it, they are clever. But they also do not have an appetite for risk. They do not want to get caught. They want to make as much money as possible and then drive off in a golden Lamborghini with 10 pound notes shooting out the back of it and then go off and retire in Marbella or the Caribbean or wherever you want to go to, okay? So they don't want to get caught, but they know that if they continue, the more they continue in that line of work, the more they will get caught. So why not allow people like you and I to go onto the dark web? and buy ransomware from them. So they will go onto the dark web, go onto a marketplace such as Alphabay, Silk Road, et cetera, and then from these marketplaces, they can sell ransomware. And they sell you a wonderful little portal where you can see how many people, under the name of clients, you have infected, uh, how many payments you... <laughs> That's gotta be a joke of some kind, right? How many um, uh, payments you've got, how much you've earned, et cetera. They've given you a wonderful portal that is frankly nicer than I would argue some of the vendors that you more than likely work with. Okay, like this is as simple as it comes when it comes to ransomware as a service, and there is a reason for that. Because it costs about 700 to to $1,000, so it's fairly cheap. And then they get a 10 to 20% cut of every single infection that you guys get paid out. They're now doing monthly recurring revenue as well. This is excellent, this is a brilliant business model for them, okay? So this is the kind of one of the new ways that we're seeing ransomware, uh, or the ransomware epidemic definitely uh, uh, growing. We're also seeing the dark web is used for a multitude of other things. Uh, exploits are constantly being sold on the dark web. So much so that I literally went on there two days ago to take this screenshot from my mobile phone. I went to one, I, I actually just Googled darknet markets, uh, went on there, went through a contents, found one I didn't have to log into. And um, under hacking, I could find ransomware, malware, botnets, I could find DDoS attacks, hackers for hire, which is the coolest term I think I've ever heard. All of this was easily purchasable on the dark web. Now, the reason I talk about this is because at the start of this uh, presentation, I said to you guys that we are fighting against cyber gangs. And yes, that is true. Cyber gangs are a huge, huge problem that we are finding. But sadly, it is also everyday people like you and I who can, for the low price of $700 to $1,000, go onto the dark web, purchase ransomware, and then send it to my ex-wife. Um, I, I don't have an ex-wife. This gentleman's like, yes, get me in there. So <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Yeah, get the money back. That's fair. So look, it, is, it is very, very easy to become one of these cyber hackers. And this is not a, you should go and do it. Please don't do it. I need to stress that. I'm just showing you how easy it is for people to go ahead and do this. I did actually a presentation a few years back on how to access ransomware as uh, a service through the dark web to a, uh, a college. And uh, I had a 14-year-old kid come up to me afterwards and say, hey, what was that website you were on? <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm not fucking telling you that. Like, this is, you're not allowed to know there. So how is it that we can realistically solve this problem? Uh, putting it bluntly, malware is just software. When we look at it, yeah, okay, so malware is just written in the same code that we write software in. C Sharp, C Plus, Java, Python, etc. It's It is the same kind of stuff. It is, at the end of the day, an application. Um, software, by definition, pretty much provides a service to the user. Malware does provide a service. It may not be a nice service for you guys, but it does provide a service at the end of the day, right? It provides a service to the threat actor. So, how is it that we can protect against it? And right now, we use all of these tools. So we use the lovely buzzwords that we all like to talk about. Uh, ransomware detection and AI and 2.0 and SOX and NOX and what else have we got? Heuristics. Really, really cool stuff that make us sound like we know what we're talking about there, okay? And I'm not gonna tell you these are bad because they are excellent tools to have. Like, realistically, you should still have EDRs, you should have AV tools because they are 
a strong part of a cybersecurity stack that is needed. But what I would say is we need to look at our cybersecurity <coughs> solutions and our cybersecurity stacks that we are implementing at this minute in time. Okay? So we like to break it down into three individual sections. The first of which is very simple. Security awareness training. It's the human side. Okay? That is, Doris, stop picking up USBs in the car park and plugging them into machines. We all have Doris. Doris is lovely. But she does cause a huge amount of problems. The majority of cybersecurity attacks that you will get are going to be from user error or from users doing stupid things. So we need to try and protect against that. Training is a key, key thing. The problem is, at the end of the day, Doris will always do that. There's nothing we can do to get around that. She is going to do that. So we need to shift up towards detection. And this is where most people tend to sit. And they are great tools. This is where your EDR sits, your MDR, XDR, ZDR, YDR, whatever other DRs you want to call them. You've got your AV solutions in here, anti-spam, etc. Yeah, Great tools, but the problem is they are detecting an issue. They're telling you if a problem is there. I don't really care if the problem's there. Why was it allowed to run to start off with is my argument there. Very good tools, but we want to have controls in place to stop this from happening in the first place. And by having each three corners of this wonderful little pyramid or triangle, we can help to build a stronger cybersecurity solution. Now, this is where zero trust comes in, which is another one of these lovely buzzwords. So, you know, do bear with me when I do say it. But if you think about zero trust in its simplest form, and if you ask any, anyone, you will more than likely get about 10 different answers as to what zero trust is. Zero trust realistically, at the end of the day, is just least privilege. That is all it is. It is nothing new. We have been talking about least privilege for years. Zero trust itself, the term, was coined in 1994 by some guy doing his doctorate. Uh, and he thought, that sounded really cool. We'll go ahead and use that. It pretty much then dropped off the face of the earth. It was used a couple times in the early 2000s until about, I think it was 20, 2008, 2010 time, which is when Gartner then, no, Forrester then picked it up and started utilizing it a bit more. Okay. Since then, we have seen the name Zero Trust growing dramatically, especially since 2018 when I think it was Google or something that started to really talk. No, White House. The White House in the US started to really talk about it. So Zero Trust means a lot of different things to a lot of different people because it's kind of been this, this thing that we've just kind of forgotten about. But in its simplest form, it is just least privilege. It is, at the end of the day, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you, lovely man. Do you give everyone that you know keys to your house? No. Stupid idea, right? Who would do that? That's all least privilege realistically is. You give the keys to your house, the keys to the kingdom, etc., to the people that you trust. Now, we can apply zero trust and the mindset of zero trust in a huge parts of our lives, not just from a technology perspective. But frankly, I'm not going to sit here and tell you how to run your lives because, I mean, look at how I'm dressed today. Uh, we're not going to go down that route. So. What can I help you with from a cybersecurity perspective? Allow what you need and block everything else. Who's heard of allow listing? Either someone is using a lot of deodorant in there, or there's <laughs> something very odd going on. Who here has heard of allow listing? Come on, uh, it comes under a few names. Allow listing, deny by default, default deny, or the one that everyone knows it as is whitelisting. Yeah? Who here has deployed an allow listing solution? Anyone? Right, gentlemen. I'm sorry, it's your turn. You, you put your hand up. Did you have fun deploying that solution? I could. Yes, painful. Thank you. That's all I need. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is incredibly painful. Every time I asked that, you, you were saying words, and I was like, I have no idea what he's saying. And then I heard painful. That's yes. Uh, Deploying an allow listing solution is often viewed as an incredibly painful piece. Because frankly, you need to know what you want to explicitly allow. Can you tell me every single file in your machines that you want to go ahead and allow? No. It's going to take you quite a bit of time. Often when you're deploying these solutions, it can take three to six months. So long time frame, pretty painful. And then when you do go ahead and deploy properly, it can often go wrong because we're humans at the end of the day. Okay? How is it that we can do it a little bit differently, allowing what you need but blocking everything else? We have a learning mode. So we sit on your machine for between seven and 10 days, essentially allow just what we find on that machine to run. Everything else is going to be denied. I'm assuming everyone has everything they need to run on their machines already. Yeah? Because where else would it literally be? Simple. 
So next up, living off the land attacks. So living off the land attacks are essentially ways to be able to utilize software that already exists to be able to attack your machines. It's why threat actors can go ahead and utilize things like Office to be able to attack PowerShell. Office can call PowerShell natively. It has no reason to be able to do so. PowerShell can access all your files and folders. I have a command. If you want to test your cybersecurity suite, do come and see us at the end of this when you're allowed out again. At our stand just there, I will run a command on your machine, which will take, actually, I'll plug a USB into your machine. It will run a command, which will take a copy of your data and upload it to some Google blob storage. If you think that your cybersecurity suite can stop it, do come and see us. If I win, I get to keep your data. I have done this. I have not failed yet. I would genuinely, and genu from, a, from a, a, an interest in cybersecurity, please do come see us if you do think it can, because I would love to see kind of what solutions are, there are out there to do stop this. We need to limit what these apps can do, OK? Very simple. Let's ring fence them. Say, you can run, but you can't access my data. You're not allowed to access the internet. You can't access any of my applications, et cetera. Who here has users with admin privileges on their machine? I'll save you putting your hands up, probably about 50% of you in the room. Uh, it sadly is just a part of life, whether it be devs, whether it be old apps from the early 2000s that haven't been updated in years and years and years, and only work on Windows 10 and 11 by having admin. Let's take away admin privileges from users, but allow them to run individual applications as an administrator. Okay? Storage control is very simple. Block USBs, please block them, or allow specific USBs. Just have storage granularity there, as well as limiting what applications can do on your machine. Every app that you have installed can access every piece of data that you have on your machine, which is terrifying in itself. So we need to go ahead and limit that down. And then the final piece that I wanted to touch on is how we can protect our networks today. Because everything I'm talking about there is realistically on the endpoint itself. Some of it's network storage, but endpoint itself. We need to protect our networks because realistically, when we start to look at our networks today, it is incredibly hard to secure them. Because realistically, there's no network anymore. We have shifted from being a, everyone goes to the office, to now a ton of people working from home, okay? We've got people who travel when they work. We need to make sure these are protected, because before they were protected by a lovely fuzzy firewall on their network, they are now no longer protected by that, because they are just on the wide open internet. And we're sharing it with spooky countries like Russia and China and North Korea. You can tell this slide is really built for Americans, can't you? Like, at the end of the day, <laughs> scary countries. But we're sharing it with countries, we're sharing it with bad threat actors, et cetera, who do want to take our data. So this is my second to last slide, I believe, and then you can kick me off, I promise. He's like, get off now. Network access control. We need to put on-device firewalls on our, um, on our uh, hardware to be able to keep them protected. Deny access by default, and then allow granular access based on preset or predefined rules. By doing all of these things, I'm not going to say this is going to give you total data protection and total security, and then you don't need any other vendor. If I, anyone says that, please run in the opposite direction. But what I can say is it can help to strengthen your cybersecurity stack and help to minimize and hopefully mitigate a hell of a lot of attacks that are out there. Thank you for your time today and for bearing with me. Uh, if you have any questions, please do feel free to come and see either myself or my very tall friend, Josh. He is out there. He's the one who looks like the BFG. Um, do come and see us. We are more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.